First of all, one of the noblest professions I think that we've got is politics. We should hold our, our politicians to more account than we do. And the idea of public service is a very important aspect. That's one of the disappointing things for me as a first year politician, if you like, being in the parliament because I was a strong supporter of the Prime Minister for many years because he highlighted how the former Prime Minister, um, Julia Gillard, had misled the Australian electorate. And I was very disappointed on budget night to find the same thing. You'll see here a slide, our pledge, no cuts to education, no cuts to health, no changes to pension, no changes to GST, no cuts to the ABC, SBS, under any government I lead, Tony Habit. And what do we find on, on budget night? We've got horrific cuts right across the nation. You know, as a company director, if I did that, if I lied to my shareholders and made changes later on, I'd be charged with deceptive and misleading conduct. And that would mean that I could spend some time in jail because I fraudulently put out there something that was wrong. So why shouldn't the public, why shouldn't the Australian electorate hold the Prime Minister and the Liberal Party to the same level of accountability? We need to have that more and more in government if we want to get good government for Australians. But most importantly, looking at the backdrop, why is this the case? What, what's the reason that we have to go to such an extraordinary length? If we look at the IMF net data, getting an idea what our what is the real situation of the debt position of Australia, the red bars you see there represent the OECD average of debt to the GDP of the various economies. And you'll see there that the average for the OECD of debt is 73%. In blue tracks the Australian position. We are at the present time at about 12% of our GDP. That means we're the third lowest country of debt in the OECD. So there is no debt crisis. What's the real story? What's going on here? It seems to me that politicians get elected, they blame the opposition for whatever state the economy's in, and then they raise as much cash that they can. In year two, they go on and say, it's all really difficult, but we've got to maintain the balance. And they raise more money and take and cut more things, and suddenly they release it in year three so that everybody gets re-elected, and they say, if we hadn't done that in year one or two, we couldn't have done now what we're doing in year three. Now, I think that's a very bad way to approach a politics, and a lot of people suffer in the meantime. I was called yesterday by four members of my electorate, four elderly women from ages from 72 to 87, from Budrum, who had voted for the Liberal National Party their entire lives, who didn't vote for me at the last election, but they pointed out that they give their pension check to the nursing home they're staying at every week, and they give them back $15. Some of them had to go to the doctors three and four times a week, but they just didn't have the money to pay the co-payment of $7.50, and they didn't know what they would do. And they said that they won't ever be voting for the LNP again. Next, if we look at the net interest payments that Australia's paying under the OECD, these are all OECD figures confirmed by our, state, our um, federal parliamentarian in Canberra. We see our net interest payments have come down dramatically from where they were in 1997, 1998. Even on an interest payment basis, we're very, very low when it comes to OECD figures. The next graph talks to you about unemployment. Where do we stand on unemployment in the OECD? And you'll see uh, in Australia, we've got an unemployment rate of about 5.6% and the OECD rate, harmonised quarterly data, shows that it's around 8%. So we're doing relatively well compared to other OECD countries. And then, of course, that's one side of the ledger. That's the debt. But what about our social benefits and what we, what we have to give out? This shows you every OECD economy, public cash benefits as a percentage of GDP. And what it shows is Australia is at the, close to the bottom at around about 9%. And if you look at places like Japan, they're 12% of GDP. Italy's up around 18%, most of the Euro European companies are around 18%. But the interesting one is the United States of America. Um, their public cash benefits are approaching 9% while we're at 8 So we're even lagging behind the United States when it comes to what we're doing in social welfare for our citizens. If we look in particularly the public old age um, uh, graph, which is the next one, you'll see that Australia spends, uh, this, is a, this is the latest figures, unfortunately, they publish them every five years, 
but we spend 5.1% of our GDP on public old, old age pensions. And of course Japan spent 10.1% of their GDP, or twice as much, as did Poland, and even the United States had spent 6% while we spent 5.1% on our old age pensions. So when we have a look at it, we see that on both ends of the scale, Australia, first of all, isn't in a bad debt situation, and secondly, what we spend in social welfare is roughly about half what other OECD economies spend. Why then do we get all this misinformation in the press, everywhere else? We know the government's got 1,900 spin doctors that put this material out because they want to create an environment where, where, where you have to respond. That's one of the reasons that they've brought in the debt tax and things like that. So in our party, how we're going to respond, we're going to stop Tony Abbott doing a number of things in the Senate. First of all, in relation to pensions, we won't support in the Senate any change to the current pension scheme. The only change we wanted to support in the pensions was when I suggested in Parliament the other day that we should link the age that parliamentarians get their pension to the age that the general community gets their pension. But that didn't go over too well. I thought it was one day of moving the pension age down to 39. They didn't like that one. And the doctor's co-payment. Again, if you're on the pension, if you're in a disadvantaged position, having access to a doctor is extremely important. You don't want to be at the twilight age of your life, at 87 years old or 90, not be able to call the doctor in, worry about five or seven dollars if you've got some concern or you're in some pain. Surely we as Australians are better than that. It wouldn't matter even if we had a debt crisis, we shouldn't be abandoning our old people. The next measure that we'll be opposing in the Senate is waiting six months for government support in the dole when you leave school. What we're encouraging then is crime. What do people do if they have no money, they haven't had a start in life, and they're not eligible for government assistance or government programs? Parts of Melbourne have 50% youth unemployment. Sections of Tasmania have reached up to 65%. If you go to the Hunter Valley in New South Wales, La Trobe Valley in Victoria, and you go to central Queensland and other places, youth unemployment has become a real problem. We don't want to increase the youth suicide rates. We don't want our young people to not think well of themselves. I know that I enjoyed the benefit of Gough Whitlam when I was a young guy, and I left school, and I was on unemployment benefits for six months, and it was able to give me a start in my life so that I could do more for the country. And I know since that time I've given millions of dollars back to the Australian, Australian uh, Taxation Department. So we don't want to be too hard on people just when they're starting out. We don't want to make them feel inadequate that they've got to rely on their parents for another six months when their friends are out, out enjoying it. We've got to worry about their self-image. We've got to give them encouragement and help. And we've got to stop these sort of things. And that's what we'll do um, in the Senate in July. And that's why none of these measures... I've talked to Bill Shorten the Greens and others, and they agree with us that none of these measures will be introduced by the Abbott government. OK, so that was a little bit of a comment on the budget. Now I'll give you my real speech. <laughs> we meet today in a city known for its strength among people known for their resilience. We find ourselves in need of both strength and resilience. Good government is about the separation of powers, the separation of parliament from the executive, the judiciary, and the separation of the judiciary from the executive. Lady Justice stands for the rights and the freedoms of all of us. She wears a blindfold, so she may judge all people free from bias and preconceptions. So she, she may judge all people fairly and carefully balancing in her hands here the facts of the, and the law on the scales of justice to deliver Swiss justice by her sword. With her sword, she uses her sword to protect her independence of action from government interference. Campbell Newman has placed a dagger in the back of Lady Justice in Queensland. Newman has cowardly criticised the judiciary that can't defend itself, passing laws which impinge upon the rights and aspirations of all Queenslanders. As Mr Justice Dowsett said recently, in effect, the law is the adhesive cement which holds society together and at the same time reflects and defines its character. In particular, an authoritarian legal system will bespeak and foster an authoritarian society. A liberal democratic legal system will bespoke and foster a liberal democratic society. In this context, the law is not merely the written words which reflect or prescribe legal rights and duties and the methods of recognising and enforcing those duties. It's about the values of society. 
It's about what we stand for and what we aspire to become. And that must be reflected in our parliament and in our laws that we live under. Justice Dowsett said that politicians and public servants are well motivated, experienced, and de but demonstrates the gap between the government and the people can sometimes be extreme. And that's what it's become here in Queensland. Distance can blunt a politician from the sensitivity of the electorate. The attack on the education and the health system by the Newman and Abbott regimes strikes at the interests of all citizens. The cost through 12 years of school is less than the cost of one year unemployment to a society. A good education policy is not only good social policy, it's good economics. Effective public health measures and medical care depend in the final analysis at action at a state level. How long will Queenslanders tolerate the slow decline of our hospitals and the removal of proper staffing levels and the decline in patient care? The steady decline in the working conditions in Queensland hospitals does the bidding of private health industry eager to reduce costs and increase profits by privatising all Queensland hospitals? How long will Queenslanders tolerate pictures of testicles in a glass being sent by LNP state members over the internet, chairman of the ethics committee? How long can we tolerate such standards in our parliament? How long will the LNP and the Premier tolerate as part of the Queensland government, a former police minister and chairman of the ethics committee, pleading guilty to diverting $7,000 into his pocket and remaining a member of parliament and a member of the Liberal National Party? What sort of example does that give to our children? What sort of example does that give to the fairness of our society? How long will Queenslanders tolerate Newman and Nichols trying to sell our hospitals and our schools to their mates? How long will Queenslanders tolerate the attempt to destroy the independence of law and judiciary in this state? How long can we tolerate lobbyists controlling our government for their clients, making money out of it, the enterprise of Queenslanders? How long can Queenslanders tolerate Newman, Sinis and Nichols as being the only decision makers in government? with the destruction of cabinet rule in Queensland and the destruction of any sort of undertaking from the electors members of the parliament? And how long will Queenslanders tolerate corruption and the diversion of state funds into political advertising such as the Strong Choices campaign which you've just seen on television which cost the taxpayer six million dollars? And the sad thing about it, only 20% of it was shown in Queensland, the rest of it was shown in every other state of Australia. It's not just corrupt in using the money for that purpose, it's incompetent in placing it in other states because Queenslanders mostly live in Queenslanders. How long will Queensland tolerate senior public servants joining lobbyist companies, then negotiating deals with the government? How long will Queensland tolerate the lies about our state debt and the handicapping of our state's economic development and the persecution of minorities and the loss of political rights of association, taking the blindfold off Lady Justice? How long will Queenslanders tolerate the threats and subversion of elected members of parliament and the destruction of the role of cabinet and decision-making processes of the state? The LNP and its failure to have LNP policies introduced is one of the tantamount dis disasters for this state. Newman, Sini and Nichols all said together that they wouldn't follow LNP policy after they were elected. That's the policy the people of Queensland voted for. This state is run by three stooges for Santo Santoro, before he was treasurer of Queensland, Nichols was the a treasurer of Santo Santoro's state campaign for the Queensland Parliament. And every morning, his father, who was the chairman of that, um, that group, meets him in Parliament House. He's not a lobbyist, so you don't know that he's there. Alan Jones has led the charge from Sydney, calling for the establishment of a royal commission in the activities of the Queensland government. He's done that for a number of good, sound reasons. Newman has destroyed the dependence of the CMC, removed the bipartisan nature of the CMC and turned it into a Newman Gestapo, headed by one of his best political mates who he saved from persecution by appointing him as head of the CMC and having the parliamentary committee with oversight dismissed. Queensland does not have an upper house. Queensland has a bitter experience in the past with corruption and centralised influence of politicians. The Australian Senate is a house of review. And I'm calling today for the establishment of, by the Australian Senate, and I'm sure they'll do it after July, of a select committee, a Senate select committee to carry out a comprehensive and detailed investigation into the activities of the human government. 
Such a committee, when appointed, would conduct public hearings at every major centre of Queensland. So the people of this state will know that what's been happening in the last two or three years, why and the motivation that they want to sell our hospitals and our schools and give away with the tried and proved system of government that we've had in the Westminster system. The fact that there are people in this state who are separated from the community whose, whose right to bail is limited. We need a transparent system where all citizens are treated equally under the law, where all crime is deterred and the community protected. We must always be ready to offer incentive for all citizens to meet their obligations to our community. We cannot persecute people for the colour of their skin, their political beliefs or who they associate with. Freedom of association is the essence of political freedom. You have no doubt heard about the words of Pastor Neuler concerning the rise of the Nazis in Germany. First they came for the communists and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me and there was no one less to speak for me. In the next election, Palm United will seek to speak for all Queenslanders and stand candidates in this state and seek the support of Queenslanders, especially the members of the Liberal National Party who have not had any of their policies they presented at the last election implemented by the Newman government. We need to give all former local authorities the right to determine their own future. If we were in government, we would insist upon it. Local communities having the right to reverse re-amalgamation decisions. We would also seek to pass a law repealing all of the acts that have been passed by the Newman government and obliterate Newman's influence from Queensland life. But most importantly, would support the resumption without compensation of any assets of the people of Queensland that have been sold, privatised, leased or disposed of, or outsourcing of any government services. There was a time when Queensland led the country in growth and economic indicators, a time when we had more growth than any other state in Australia. Cutting red tape is not enough. We need to reform our infrastructure to stimulate our state's economy, to create more jobs in tourism and policies to boost our construction industry and our resource industries. We need to reform our departments to be forward-looking and motivated to make enterprise happen. There are so many things that could be done in Queensland to make, a better, to make this state better and its community more prosperous. Thanks very much. As, as an APN journalist representing readers in our regional electorates, how will regional Queenslanders benefit from your influence in the Senate? Well, we've got a number of policies, particularly for the regions. One of them is that we seek to reintroduce zonal taxation. That's where people uh, get an incentive to go and live in the regions. And we was operating in Australia up to about 1974. So there's a lot of communities in Queensland that have lost their doctors, their lawyers and other people. And we think it's important that we get those, those things back. But secondly, we, we want to draw attention to the plight of um, um, infrastructure and services in our region. Queensland's a decentralised state. There's been a cutting back in our hospitals. If you look at the situation in Maryborough, for example, the, um, they've taken all their pathology down to the Harvey Bay Hospital and things have been moved just to save money. You know, it's not all about the gross domestic product. The GDP measures a lot of things. It measures the, the cost of the ambulances to take carnage from our road. It measures the cost of our prisons. Uh, the cost of our armies, but it, do, but it doesn't measure the smile of a child's face in the morning, uh, the integrity of our marriages, the uncorruptibility of our public officials. It doesn't measure all the things that make life worthwhile. So we think government's not just about making a profit, that's business, but providing something better for the community. Thank you. I throw to the media tables. Michael. Uh, Michael McKenna from The Australian. Mr Palmer, you've, you've spoken about what uh, you and your new colleagues uh, in the Senate uh, will oppose uh, in regards to the budget. Uh, what measures that were announced last Tuesday will you support? Um, and uh, among them, are they the, uh, the debt levy on, on the higher income earners? Well, we don't support the debt levy because we don't think there's a debt problem. We don't want to create a hysterical environment about debt when I've just demonstrated to you. OECD figures shows it's not a debt problem, so we certainly won't support that. We'll support Julie Bishop's initiative to uh, reduce our foreign aid and, and have it focus more on Australian expenditure. I think that's a good move. There's about $8 billion of um, support there, which is long overdue. For a long time, Australia gave foreign aid to a lot of countries and they went to corrupt government officials and never got down to the people. 
and uh, there's no point borrowing money to lend it over, give it away overseas. So we think that's a very, very good move. Um, I think we'd also support making our universities competitive and be having the right to charge fees uh, separately for what they should be. But we wouldn't support our, um, our, our, our policy is to do away with Hex to come back with a competitive situation for a free scholarships for our universities for students. Um, that differs with the coalition. So there, there's some of the things that we would support. Um, I'm Anna Hartley, a student from the um, University of Queensland. Yeah. You've previously stated in response to the budget that we need Australia's cleverest people taking themselves and this great nation forward, not burying them under a mountain of debt. Could you please be more specific about your policy for university fees in Australia? Do you think that they'll disadvantage students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds? Well, I think what you need to have in, is you need to get rid of HEX first, right? Uh, HEX is a system whereby we limit the creativity of our best graduates for 10 to 15 years till they lose their creativity in middle age. Right? So we need to take advantage of that for the nation and get that moving. And we, we can't do that if they have to take particular jobs to pay back debt. It's a, it's, a great, it's a great sacrifice for Australia. So we think we should get rid of HEX. At the same time, the uh, amount of money that was generated by our, our uh, university sector a few years ago was about $18 billion a year in exports. Now it's down to $15 billion a year. So we need to be able to make the universities free to compete internationally. So in that regard, dealing with international students and other people, we would support the concept that universities uh, set their own fees in dealing with overseas students so that we get the maximum benefit for domestic students and for the Australian government from the assets that we've got. And we also build up better and stronger cultural links in dealing with foreign affairs and things like that. So we think that's a good balance. And as I said before, uh, a good education policy uh, is not just a good social policy, it's a good economic policy. That's what makes the, the parts of the United States preeminent. If you go to MIT or some of the areas in California, you see the enterprise and, and the ideas that throw forward. You know, governments may come and go, but ideas go on forever. And we really need to need, need to make that happen at you know, our universities. Uh, Nick Wiggins, for uh, BC. You've outlined two goals: a Senate inquiry into the Newman government, and also contesting the next state election. How do you reconcile the obvious conflict there, and the no doubt the criticism that will be made that you'll be seeking a Senate inquiry for political reasons? Well, an inquiry is really about the Senate saying that we'll listen to what the people have got to say. It's not the senators that will make the decision. It's, it's people who will come forward in Queensland with information that they feel they want to present in a, a protected uh, scenario, which they may fear during today. So it creates them with that op opportunity. I mean, I'm responding really to the, what Alan Jones has been saying on uh, radio in Sydney about some of the cases that he's had. If you've been listening to that, you know it's clear that there needs to be the opportunity for Queenslanders to speak up about their state. It shouldn't hurt the government or anyone else to just be presented with the facts. Uh, Mr Palmer, Nathan Paul from Australian Associated Press. It's a bit off topic, but I have to ask it. Um, Barnaby Joyce said this morning that parties have some, that have someone's name in it tend to be less about philosophy and are more of a cult. Uh, what, what do you make of that? Are you a cult leader? Well, I, well, I, well, I don't think so. I mean, um, I should just explain to you how our party got called Palmer United. We originally registered the name, had a press conference for the name United Australia Party. And indeed, Billy Hughes, the former Prime Minister's granddaughter, was a member of our party. My father used to work with that party too, so that's what we were seeking to stand. But um, interests associated, I think, with the Liberal Party registered the name Uniting Australia Party with the um, Australian Electoral Commission before the last um, federal election. So we could have taken them to court because we held the trademark, the business name, etc., for Uniting, Uniting Australia Party. Uh, and we decided not to do it because it wouldn't focus on the issues which we thought were more important. And uh, the executive asked me would I give my name to the party and I did that. And uh, we stood candidates in every seat uh, in the Commonwealth and the House of Representatives in the Senate. And as you know I was elected to the House of Representatives. We've got three senators elected. And um, the brand went out there as Palmer United and it stayed there ever since. But at some stage the party will go back to its original name I believe. Mr. Palmer, Mark Ludlow from the Financial Review. I just wanted to talk to you about the different contrasts between the federal government, which seems to, obviously apart from the old Barnaby Joyce comment, seems to have toned down its rhetoric against you, because they know they have to negotiate with you come July 1, 
and with the, the uh, approach of the LNP government here in Queensland, where they seem to have r ramped up the pressure on you, obviously, because they see you as a threat for the next state election. Yeah. I just wanted to talk to you about, has the Abbott government uh, or key Senate leaders actually sat down to start negotiating with you over key policies? Well, I've had discussions with, um, with, the, you know, with Erica Betts, the leader of the Senate, and also with Christopher Pine, the leader of the House, on a number of issues. Um, but I, I think the reason that um, the uh, Newman government has been very critical of us, because there are things there to hide, there's a lot of things that haven't come out, and they know that through my background, um, being in the LNP, I know what they are. And uh, they're, they're worried that we will make these things public before the lead up to their election, which we probably will. Any other media questions? Um, Mr Palmer, Cathy Border from Channel 10. Just keen to hear your take on how you see this budget stoush between the Prime Minister and the Premiers playing out, please. Well, in the old days when I used to run campaigns and do campaigning for the LNP, um, I think this is a manufactured fight. You'll, you'll see a situation where the Premiers, most of the more Liberal Premiers, three of them facing short-term elections, will come up and they'll stand, we're standing for the people, we're not going to accept this. And then after argy-bargy for a while, Tony Abbott will come th through and give them concessions. And it's designed to boost their popularity, basically. That's the reason for it. I mean, you're the one brand, whether you're federal or whether you're state, you've got close working relationships together. I think even the Premier and uh, the Prime Minister travelled together this morning to attend a funeral. They're very close friends. So um, this is just manufactured to mislead the media. Mr Palmer, Josh Bavis from ABC. I just wanted to ask you, you ha said that you have this insider knowledge. What are some examples that you would like to see come out of such a Senate inquiry? Well, we can't give you all the information one day. But um, it, it's not for me to say. If there was a Senate inquiry, it would be for our people to present our information, other Queenslanders to do the same, and for them to make a determination on it. Um, there's certain advantages of a Senate Select Committee um, uh, making a submission. It's uh, similar to a court scenario, so people have got more protection if they come forward and less to fear. Uh, Mr Palmer, Jason Tin from the Courier Mail. Um, yes, Jason. Okay. So here's a press release that hit our inboxes this morning from your Queensland parliamentary leader, Alex Douglas, um, titled, PUP tells Liberals to stop sniping over budget cuts and get on with the job. In it, he says that surely working together for the greater good of our community is the best plan rather than squabbling over budget allocations. You've outlined a number of things that you're very unhappy with um, yeah. with Tuesday night's budget. Um, irrespective of, of what you think uh, about Mr Newman's motives and those of the other premiers, mm -hmm. um, would you not concede that it's in the interest of each state to have their state leader disagreeing publicly with the Prime Minister if, if they feel that that is uh, warranted? Well, if they feel it is, but I think you'll find out, you'll see what will happen. But uh, Alex, I think, was referring about the Queensland budget, which is coming up. That's still yet to go through. But... Um, we're still opposing some of these measures, and uh, these measures are not fait accomplis. They haven't been passed through the Senate. Not all of them can be supply initiatives. So it's only fair and reasonable that I should say to the people of Australia what our position is. It's not fair to the government or to anyone else to labour on the apprehension that we're going to allow some of these things to happen. I mean, you know, there are a number of people who have been medically distressed in the last couple of days, elderly people in Australia, because they've heard this information and they've dealt with it in the wrong way. So if we can somehow dampen that from happening, I think that's a good thing. Uh, Mr Palmer, Emmy Kabansky from Seven News. Um, I guess what's your solution, though, to the Commonwealth state funding? High GST? Uh, is there something else in mind? Well, honesty is, that the, is, the, is the main solution. As I said to you and how I demonstrated before, with Australia having only 12% of GDP, and I think the critical thing is to understand that we are one of the only 13 countries in the world that have a AAA credit rating. Now, do you think we'd have a AAA credit rating being the top 13 countries in the world and for debt to be as bad as it is? So this is the biggest speed up, you know, since Noah's Ark got back to, back to earth. You know, really, it's amazing how this, is, this has been beaten up in the press. It's just not true. We have a AAA credit rating because our credit is the best in the world and we don't have a very high debt level. Even Rupert Murdoch at the IPA dinner last year said how low Australia's debt was. So it's not a question about debt that we can't do things. What we do need in Australia is forward-looking visionary policies where we can project and stimulate our economy. If you have a look at President Obama, he's injected $85 billion in the US economy uh, since the GFC every month. And now he's injecting about $65 billion a month. That's equivalent 
to about $6 billion in Australia. Now, how could we do that? How could we stimulate our economy? Um, if we move the date for provisional tax from how provisional tax is paid in Australia at the moment, we, businesses are required to pay it in advance before they've earned that money. If we just move that back to the end of the year, that would give us $70 billion of injection in the Australian government uh, economy in businesses' hands. And what every time that $70 billion was turned over, we, the government would get 10% GST. So that would be, in three times, they would get $21 billion more revenue than they're getting now. And that's just changing the reporting date. It's not, even, it's not even borrowing any money. So these are the types of structural changes that Australia should make to generate more money supply, more domestic demand and more jobs for Australians. And of course, with that $70 billion released into the economy, more people would be employed, uh, more consumers would have more money, and we'd create a, a better future for Australia. That's where we should be looking, to stimulate our economy and following what the United States has done. But if you have a look at what they've done in Europe, where they've had austerity and cuts, you've seen what the results are. And they want to do, follow those same policies here in Australia. The result is a lot of our export markets will decline and, and uh, the United States will take them because they're better, stronger and more prepared than we are. I think Mr McKenna, was it? One over there. Michael McKenna, yeah. again from the um, I can the barely Australian. see you, Michael, anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's better. Um, your company, Mineral Mineralogy, and, and the Chinese company, Cytec, have been mm. brawling in the, in the courts. Uh, there's been arbitration last week. Uh, how is that, uh, that court battle going? And um, they've accused you of um, siphoning off about $12 million from the port. Um, can you address that? Where's the money gone? Well, they haven't accused us. That, that, that's just a beat-up by the Australian and Hedley Thomas. Um, you know, <laughs> to be honest with you, every week there's a good, uh, a good uh, bi uh, story about me. I've enjoyed reading them in the, in the Australian for the last um, year or so. But it's probably because that we, we think that we need to have an independent Australia and we think it's nothing wrong with challenging the major parties. I know Rupert doesn't agree with me. He was very much in, a supporter of Tony Abbott when he came to Sydney at the IPA. So that's the wrath you have if you go against the system. But if I've done anything wrong ever, of course, people can make a complaint to the police. I've been in politics now for 40 odd years, so I went through the Fitzgerald inquiry. Nothing's, the only reason I'm serving in this capacity is because I think I can make our country stronger and better. And uh, as you know, I don't get any money for being in parliament. I donate all the funds I get to charity. So this is the country that I love, and uh, that's why I serve, that's the only reason. I'm, as an individual, not important. It's the ideas that really matter. That's what we've got to look at, not, not individuals. So when the um, declarations come back uh, from the federal election and the most recent West Australian uh, Senate election, all the money that's been uh, spent in campaigning for your political party can be reconciled? We can see where it's all come from? Of course you can. And we've already lodged up um, um, disclosure statements, I think, the ones that were required to. And the other ones will be lodged when they're required too. But a lot of it comes from me because I've got too much money and that's a burden for anyone. Thanks very much. I think we might end the uh, questions there.